following sermon was delivered at the 1030 worship service at the United Methodist Church of Kent. Please enjoy. A few years ago now, back in the summer of 2018, I had the very unexpected experience of spending a couple of days and nights in the hospital. I didn't know it at the time, but a few weeks earlier, apparently, I had picked up Lyme disease and its effects traveled almost immediately to my heart where it blocked the electrical communication between my heart's chambers. On the Sunday morning I was in the hospital, I experienced a few brief periods when my heart stopped beating entirely and needed to be restarted. Later on that day, after my pacemaker had been implanted, the cardiologist who had been with me throughout that morning and who had been the one to restart my heart multiple times surprised me with a question. He asked what I had experienced during those periods when my heart had been stopped, whether I had seen or heard or felt anything that I could remember. Now the question surprised me mostly, I think, because of its context, not the question itself. I've been asked similar questions often as as a pastor, folks wondering what happens to us when we die. But to be honest, the most complete and truest response I've ever been able to give to that question is quite simply to say, I don't know. I certainly know what many Christians hope, and I can offer the conviction of our faith and and my own faith that, that death is not the end of our lives and that God remains with us somehow in life and in death and in life beyond death as we have affirmed this morning. But specifically what happens, I don't know. And to be frank, neither do our scriptures. Now we know only in part, we read in 1 Corinthians 13, and today from 1 John, it hasn't appeared yet what we will be. And yet, while our scriptures do not tell us much of anything about our lives beyond death, throughout this whole Easter season, they tell us quite a lot about Jesus' life beyond death. And what we are told about Jesus' life beyond death means to shape us, to form our lives on this side of death, both our hopes and our behaviors. Two weeks ago on Easter Sunday, we read about the immediate aftermath of resurrection, the terror, dread, fear, and silence, which were the first disciples' response. And we remembered that resurrection is a process, not a single moment in time, but something that we practice and participate in over time, and that resurrection is not only about Jesus, but resurrection is about a whole new world, a world filled with possibilities and promise. Then last week, on the second Sunday of Easter, we read about the disciples hiding behind closed doors on the evening of the first Easter day, and Jesus' appearance first to the whole group and then to Thomas in particular, whom he had missed the first time around. And we remembered last week that resurrection meets us wherever we are, even in our fears and our self-doubts, or when we've missed previous opportunities, even when it is hard to believe. Still, the risen Christ comes to us and accompanies us and offers us a model for accompanying each other in our needs. Now this morning, we are reminded that resurrection includes all of us, that is, our whole selves, both body and soul. Resurrection is not just about one part of us, some ethereal or spiritual part of us as we sometimes suppose. Resurrection, according to today's gospel, includes all of who we are. Touch me, Jesus says today. Look at my hands and my feet. Touch me and see I have flesh and bones just like you. The disciples' doubts continue, though, so Jesus asks for something to eat and then shares in their meal of baked fish. They had thought that he might be a ghost, a spirit, but ghosts don't get hungry. Spirits don't eat dinner with friends. If the disciples were expecting Jesus' life beyond death to be some wispy spiritual thing, some philosophical concept or metaphor, what they got instead was the risen Christ, the creator of the whole universe, chewing and swallowing fish. Far too often we think of life beyond death as some purely spiritual thing. We imagine the souls of our dearly departed floating presumably upward into some far off heaven. 
But in today's story, the gospel seems to want us to know the resurrected life is quite physical and quite earthy. Resurrection includes not just the soul, but the body as well. Body and soul, in fact, in our faith are inseparable. They are a unity, and one is raised with the other. We affirm this truth in the oldest of our still familiar affirmations of faith or creeds, the Apostles' Creed that we said together last week, in which we say that we believe in the resurrection of the body. It can seem an odd affirmation to hold next to more popular ways of imagining. For pop culture and pop theology have tended to turn the afterlife into something like being beamed up in Star Trek some out-of-body experience and instant transportation of something misty into some great beyond. But for our tradition, for our Christian tradition rooted in our Easter faith and expressed through stories like today's gospel, resurrection always has been much more than that, more bodily and more physical, more substantial. More than an afterlife, resurrection is new life. And not just new life for us, but new life for the whole creation who groans with us now toward God's new world. A new world in which body and soul are raised and renewed together. A new heaven and a new earth. Through and through, our Christian faith is stubbornly incarnational. Not out of body, but embodied. Our bodies are not just incidental physical shells from which our spirits are waiting to spring free. We are, in fact, embodied people, worshiping and serving and living in relationship with a God who is born in a body, who touches and heals bodies, who eats and serves in a body, who is tortured and killed in a body, and who is raised and comes back to us in a body. Follow me, Jesus said, and I will show you how to fish for people. Or again, when they want to take your shirt, he said, let them have your coat too. Look at the birds of the sky. Notice how the lilies in the fields grow. Love your neighbor as yourself. At every step of the way, Jesus gave us teachings to embody. Jesus gave us concrete actions to practice. Jesus taught us to consider other folks' bodies as seriously as we consider our own. To trust the revelatory power of physical things, earthy things, birds and lilies and fields and vines and branches, sheep and all the other stuff of earth. For all of our speculations about some spiritual life beyond death, Jesus showed us constantly how essential it is that we give attention to our embodied lives on this good earth. Resurrection reminds us, as incarnation had shown us before, that this earth matters and our bodies matter. Our whole person is sacred, not some spiritual part of us only. Our whole selves, as we know ourselves to be and as we long to relate with each other in this world, And so as church, as embodied Easter people, we don't just concern ourselves with transporting souls into heaven. We care for whole persons as God does. We feed bodies and we shelter bodies and we clothe and provide health care for bodies. We insist always on the inherent and irrevocable dignity of bodies. In a world that too often uses and abuses bodies, in a world that too often values certain types of bodies and attaches shame or fear to others, we are called and we are empowered to live a different way, an Easter resurrected way, a way that reveres the sacredness and the beauty of every, every body, a way that thinks about and talks about and acts about bodies, including pleasure and pain, and diseases, and birth, and aging, and death, and sex, and sexuality, and gender identity, and expression, and varying types of physical abilities, none of those things is incidental or unimportant, for our bodies are essential to who we are as whole persons, embodied persons living in an earthy world. Notice again the details of Jesus' body in today's gospel. 
Notice that he does not rise from the dead into shiny, glowing, spiritual perfection. In fact, when he appears to his friends, he brings his scars on his body with him. He doesn't leave behind the suffering, the pain, the violence that his body has known. All of that is a part of him, his resurrected body and life. And so however else we might think about the reality of resurrection in our own lives, we might consider that too. That it includes not just our celebrations, but our sorrows. Not just our successes, but also our bodily scars. Over time, our wounds might heal, but some scars remain as enduring testaments to the totality of our lives. That all of it, all of us, has a place in the new life God is bringing. You might disagree, of course, but to me, that feels like very good news. For when I consider the scars on my own body, I think of the stories those scars tell about the life that I have lived, the the injuries, the surgeries, all the rest. All of those experiences, even the painful ones, even the hard ones, they are a part of who I am. And so I rather like the idea that those parts of me don't just disappear, that those scars might not be wiped away as though they never mattered at all, but instead maybe, just maybe, they endure as for Jesus, as marks and signs of living this embodied life. Because the resurrection is real. And like incarnation, it is not a one-time thing. God's word, God's love is not just embodied in one person long, long ago. Resurrection keeps happening, keeps embodying God's love in this world, now through our flesh and blood. That's Easter's invitation to us. Easter isn't just about Jesus, and Easter isn't just about our ability to keep living after we die. Easter is about a whole new world, now filled with possibilities, and it is about the process of living toward God's dream. Easter is about God's calling and our ability, by God's grace, to live resurrection now, with our wounds, with our scars, not being defined by them, but not having to deny them either. Because we are whole human beings, soul and body. And resurrection includes all of us, each of us and all of who we are, not only in life beyond death, but also in life before death, as we inhabit day by day God's love and live as Easter people, as bodily resurrections of God's word still made flesh. For Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Thank you for listening to this edition of the United Methodist Church of Kent Sermon Podcast. For more information about the church, visit www.kentmethodist.org.